This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Welcome to Raising Me. This is where we talk about the things that we're dealing with as parents every single day and bring in the experts for advice. I'm Adrienne Stein, a longtime journalist and a mom of three with one in preschool, middle school, and high school, trying to figure it all out just like you are. Today, we're talking about self-regulation, helping kids to learn how to get a handle on their big emotions like anger or embarrassment, excitement, frustration. And coincidentally... <laughs> While putting this episode together, I was reminded exactly what this looks like. I could see it coming. So just picture this with me. Sitting around a kitchen island, a five-year-old starting to get frustrated that his sticker wouldn't stick to the sticker page in the back of his book. So we started talking about some solutions like, go ahead and use that sticker on the designated page. Well, that was a terrible idea, a no-go, because he was on sticker page 10, the sticker that wouldn't stick was for page 58. He just simply wasn't ready for it. So I suggested, what if we put a little piece of tape on the sticker and then when he's ready for that page, he could peel the sticker and the tape off and use it on the right page. After some thought, that was determined to be the best idea, but only until right after we put the tape on the sticker. Now, I'm not gonna go into details, but let me just tell you, it was the worst idea on the planet. Now the sticker was ruined, the book was ruined, and it just needed to be thrown away. How could I have suggested such a bad idea? <sighs> actually, I, in all seriousness, like I still actually, I do feel a little bit of stress even just talking about it. Now granted, he's five, and just getting to the age where kids really learn how to manage those big emotions, Thankfully, after some yelling and screaming about the ruined sticker book, he did snap out of it almost as quickly as we got there. The thing is, we're talking today about kids and adults of all ages who have trouble with self-regulation. If you have a child with, who struggles with this, you know it can be very stressful and really heartbreaking. So today we're gonna to talk about some of the things to do before and to prevent a meltdown and why this happens. We're talking with Dr. Allison Coffin. She's a chiropractor who is passionate about working with kids and families on this. She studies the neuroscience of it all and explains to us in really simple to understand ways, the things that we can do. So we're gonna talk about some triggers. We're gonna talk about how we can help our children and really ourselves with self-regulation. Allison, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, for a parent who has a, a child with trouble with self-regulation or is dysregulated, another way of saying it, they're probably very familiar with what the signs of that look like. But for parents who maybe don't or unsure if they're their child has this as a, an issue that needs to be addressed. What exactly does it look like to be dysregulated for a child? There's many different ways you can be dysregulated. You can be dysregulated and be retreated and quiet. You can also be because you're afraid. That can be like some way like an anxious child might feel dysregulated or some outwardly dysregulated child might be chucking a toy car at your face or screaming or like won't clip themselves into that car seat or any of those, any of those things. And then they just are either yelling, screaming, crying. They just can't get control of their own emotions. That's just kind of the basic of dysregulation. That's very outward. And, you know, both those scenarios, whether they're really withdrawn into themselves or they're throwing a car in your face, as <laughs> you mentioned, is an option. Both of those are really troubling. So when we talk about self-regulation, this is something beyond like a temper tantrum. That's really associated with a toddler. What we're talking about is older kids when it comes to learning how to self-regulate or 
having trouble and being in a state of dysregulation? Yeah. So kids that are under the age of five, their brains are just not developed enough to be able to self-regulate. They're just not, we can set a base groundwork for what that looks like, model it for them so they can see it in our household. And that's very important. But as we get older, as the kids get older and they're like school aged, um, like elementary school and up, we can teach them self-regulation tools because dysregulation sometimes looks a little bit bigger in those ages. And then also the cool thing about being a parent to a child that age is that you know that kid. Like you can tell the tiny nuances of their voice or how they move their face or like you can feel the storm coming if something's going to happen. If you're in tune to your kid, you pretty much know what's going on. But someone someone with like a grandparent or something that doesn't live with them, they don't know and they don't see like the storm coming. But the dysregulation can look so clear to a parent once they're like five and older. And it can be really stressful. It can be very stressful. Real stressful, yeah. Do some kids have sort of a natural disposition to having trouble with self-regulating? There's some types of different ways that brains develop that have a harder time with with regulation. So those things are when people have non-neurotypical brains, meaning like ADHD, anxiety, autism, twice exceptional, things like that. Like their brains just work differently than the average human being. So they might feel something a lot more than you or I would feel it. Many people know about like the, like a tag on a shirt can bug a kid and they can like freak out about it. And some kids can just like be mad and be like, mom, that tag bothers me. And other kids can't verbalize it. And then they end up going into like a crazy emotional state. And you have no idea. It's just because of that tag. It's like a snowball effect because their brains don't regulate as easily as another kid's brain. A tag could be one trigger, but in general, are there triggers that tend to lead to, you know, some dysregulation? Well, one of the major triggers of dysregulation is your caregiver. So if your caregiver is dysregulated, a lot of times the kids are dysregulated. So that is not a blame on the parent. But if a parent is having a really hard time For whatever reason, a lot of us have great times in life and really hard times in life. Maybe you had like a death in your family right before your kid was born or something and you're not very regulated. It reflects in the child because you're kind of in your head or you're grieving or you're stressed about money or any of the things that happen in everyday life. A parent not being regulated mirrors how kids can become dysregulated. And there's actually part of the brain and there's studies on this called mirror neurons so it works in all throughout life, but mirror neurons is kind of like, you're like the people you, three people you hang out with. Most people have heard that saying. And because our brain mirrors the people that we see, if our parent is our primary caregiver and they're dysregulated, then we in turn become dysregulated. Or if our parent is nurturing and calm and really has like gained those skills prior to parenting, which is rare. Many people like have no idea what they're doing when they have kids. Hence the podcast. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, we learn as we go for a lot of us. Yeah. And as, as we learn, the kids can become regulated as we become regulated. So how as a parent can we help our children when we're, we're faced with, you know, just trouble with regulation? Are there some things that we can do as parents To help our children when we notice either A, it's coming, we see it, it is going to happen, or it's too late, they are in the, you know, in the moment, they're throwing the shoe, or they're just really retreated into themselves. Yeah, so the, um, one of the most important things is to come to them with empathy and love. So coming to them in an accusatory tone, I can't believe you did that, or yelling at them is not going to regulate them. It's going to escalate their dysregulation. Even though it can be very hard, it's our job as the adult to come to that situation with calm, with safety, being the calm in the storm. So they know like, I can handle your big emotion and we can get through this together. But if you add fuel to the fire, that dysregulation tantrum thing is going to last longer. Um, that's just how it goes. And it is sometimes so much easier said than done, but it is a constant reminder in so many things with parenting that sometimes it is just stepping out of the room for a minute and taking a deep breath or going for a walk 
or whatever that may be to get your own self-regulation in check, your own regulation in check. And then when it comes to preventing these kinds of things, I, I would imagine just avoiding certain triggers potentially, but then are there also coping strategies to build tolerance? You can prevent a lot of these things. You cannot prevent every single dysregulation for your child. It's going to happen. But there's many ways to prevent it. So when we think about our sen the senses in our body, like sight, taste, smell, sound, all those things, those are all things that can activate our nervous system into a resting, relaxing state or into an excited state. So if you can try to create your home to be a place that's a little bit calmer than the outside world, because you can't control that your kid will have a more regulated nervous system internally as opposed to like a very loud, smelly, like if, if a smell bothers them. So there's certain things that you can do. So you can, um, like if a kid likes a certain smell, let's say it's like lavender. That's a thing that people, that helps kids sleep all the time. You can have that in your house and it's a soothing smell. And it's not something where like, oh, smell this, right? It's just something that's calming to their nervous system. You can play music that's calming, like in the background, very softly. And there's certain types of music that works, that calms the brain and puts it in kind of a meditative state. It's a theta and beta wave music. So you can find that on Spotify or wherever you get your music and you can play that in the background. It's soothing. You don't have to have it at like a high volume. You can talk over it. Also lighting. Lighting can be a big thing that you can use to regulate your nervous system, even for yourself as a parent. So if you have like all the lights on and it's like, you know, the surface of the sun, that's not going to make you feel calm. And if you can dim the lights, that helps. Also, if a kid is in um, like something that they very like tactile that feels good to them, a lot of kids carry their blankies or their stuffies or like a fidget toy. A lot of kids have fidget toys now and that can be regulating for them should they need movement or something that they know is theirs and can soothe their nervous system. So you can have all those things in place and really set your kid up with a deep building block of regulation and have that all the time in your house. It's not very difficult. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Does sleep play a part of this? I mean, for adults, we get a little crabby when we haven't had enough sleep. Of course, that's going to be the same for kids. Does sleep exacerbate the, the issue for some kiddos? Yeah, so um, sleep is a huge thing. So no matter what age you are, if you do not get enough sleep for your particular self, so some kids need 15 hours of sleep, other kids need 10 hours of sleep, and that's like the kid. If you don't get enough sleep for your body, your cortisol levels rise, which makes your stress response higher, makes your fuse shorter. And it's just, it's like a terrible mess. So if you need to prioritize sleep for yourself or for your kid, if you need to leave that party early, do it because you'll be so much happier than if you like stayed it out. And then the next day, just going to be a nightmare. What about diet? Because diet comes to mind too as, as a potential trigger for yeah for that there's a lot of ways that you can prevent um dysregulation in your kid with diet there's certain supplements that kids take that helps calm the nervous system a very easy one that people take is dha supplement it's like fish oil that helps calm your nervous system magnesium is incredible a lot of the kids that i treat in my office that have anxiety or have a hard time sleeping they take a certain type of magnesium that i have here and it helps them tremendously and then as far as diet goes, <laughs> there's a story about my kid. He, uh, he like likes cake. He's a kid and goes to birthday parties. But we had two birthday parties one day and he said, mom, I'm just going to have cake at this party because sugar makes me a little crazy. And if I have it at this party, I know tonight's not going to be good. Well, self-awareness. <laughs> I was, I mean, I was blown away. Like, he's not always <laughs> like that. But I, I was like, oh man, like some things that I say to you go through your head. Like, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So like in sugar does spike your cortisol and your glucose. So that will make you a little bit more energetic and harder to control your physical body. That's harder. And then 
I mean, stimulants, kids shouldn't have stimulants. They shouldn't have like coffee and soda. That's, I mean, I think that's like basic. What about screens? You know, because we've talked a lot about that on on this podcast is the impact of social media and, and screens on children. Does that play a role in your experience and in your knowledge with kids who are, have trouble with self-regulation? Yeah. So I think something that we don't want to demonize screens. Right. You can use screens for a multitude of things that are good for learning. They even have them like in every classroom pretty much now. And kids need to be in the world. So watching a screen and we'll say like watching a show, it moves along faster. Your eyes move along faster across the screen because shows are captivating. I think most of us have like gotten to a Netflix binge before because the show is captivating. You're just watching it. And then your body doesn't regulate because you are watching things faster than the time of like actual life timeline. And with kids, they can't regulate their prefrontal cortex, what we talked about like right in the front of their head, when they watch too much TV and then they become dysregulated. And you'll see some kids when they're watching too much TV, whatever that is for them, say it's like an over an hour, they'll start to like move their bodies, jump up and down on the couch because they actually do want to move, but they don't want to get away from that screen because it gives you so much dopamine because it's so fun to watch. There's a couple things that we do at home, and I've taught a ton of people how to do this, is to help calm your nervous system. You can still watch that show, but there's certain things you got to do to to be able to do that. So in our house, we do this thing where you cross pattern your brain because like say we're watching three 20-minute shows. There's a 20-minute show. In between each show, you have to do these three exercises. If you do not do these three exercises, you will not be watching the next show. I mean, that can come with a fit like, ah, I don't want to do this, but whatever. That's how, that's how it goes. So w- something that I have them do is you take one hand and you hold on to your opposite side earlobe. Take the other hand, hold on to the other opposite side of your earlobe. And then you go into a deep squat and come back up. You do that 10 times because it's cross patterning your brain. So when you touch both sides of your body and engage movement, it helps your body regulate better. Another thing that we do is cross country skiers. So they stand up and then they just put their arms straight and their legs straight and they do a cross country skier. They do 10 of those. Sometimes we just do 10 jumping jacks, 10 butt kicks. And then, I mean, other things that we've done, I have a box jump in my living room. And so they do box jumps (laughs) in between shows. And it's not because they need exercise. It's because their body is going to become dysregulated if they continue to watch a show with absolutely no movement. I mean, those are all very simple things that you don't need much space for either. It's it's probably also getting in the habit for parents to say, sure, you can watch a couple shows, but in between, you know, you need to press pause and do the, you know, the, the cross with the ears and the squats or the cross country skiers or anything like that. So it's, it's not just teaching the kids. It really is also teaching us as parents to incorporate that in a, in a regular way to be, to where it becomes habit for the kids. Exactly. And then there's another thing that can help parents because they can be watching that show and you could be doing something else as an adult because you don't want to watch that show. And so setting a kitchen timer or even like an egg timer for however long the show is will remind you like, oh, that show's over. They need to do this thing. And then you all get back to whatever you were doing. So you don't have to sit there and watch that show with your kids because you might want to do something or you might have a meeting or use screens for so many different things. Or just to take five or 10 minutes to yourself and have a cup of coffee yeah, or whatever it is, you know, just, yeah, just sit, sit in peace Mm -hmm. for crying out loud. (laughs) Yeah, I I wonder too about potential long-term consequences. Like if kids who have self-regulation trouble, if they don't get support or help that they need, how does this use usually manifest itself for adults? Kids that have dysregulation troubles hopefully get help from their grown up as their kids. And then they develop these tools about all those things that we talked about. And then they become regulated adults because their brains develop. And it takes a long time for a brain to develop, especially for a male. Their, their brain doesn't fully develop until they're in their 20s. So that's just how it goes. <laughs> so they make silly decisions. A lot of times females' brains are done being fully developed, not that they can't learn more, but fully developed by the time they're 18. So we got to give kids some grace when they're teenagers as well. Like they don't, they don't know what's up. They don't. They Mm -hmm. think they don't. They don't. As a mother of a teenager. (laughs) Yeah. 
They don't. No. I'm not exactly sure what happens to people that are dysregulated when they're older. I mean, I can infer that a lot of people that are dysregulated have a multitude of issues. Well, and to your point too, you said, you know, I mean, adults often, not always, but often there may be a dysregulation with the adult when a child is showing signs of dysregulation. So you just mentioned three great activities and times in which to incorporate those into your life. But what about for adults? Would those types of exercises work? Are there other things that maybe a mom or a dad who might be listening to this and maybe is having a moment like, yeah, you know, I'm not that great (laughs) when it comes to self-regulation and what can I do to be better? Are there some simple exercises, for instance, that, that might help? Yeah, there's, there's two, th- two of them that are really easy and also really accessible. So if you work inside of the home or outside of the home, a way to transition from work to homework, like being with your kids, to reset your nervous system, because a lot of us carry what, we're, what we have in our work into our house, and we don't separate the two, like delineate it very cleanly. Um, you can take a bowl of water, you make it room temperature, And you can put it on your counter and you just leave it there. And then at the end of your day, you take your hands and it's just room temperature. You stick them in the water below your wrist and the different temperature of the water resets your nervous system in such a way where it like almost cleanses the day off of you. And I've I've done this so many times. It's unbelievable. And it will transition you like you're done with this and you're moving on to your other thing. And so it's just such a clear way to be done with one thing and move on to another. And that can really calm your nervous system. Other things that a lot of us know about is exercise is great. Sleep as much as you can. Eat whatever makes your body feel really good about. And then there's another thing that I think is that has been really helpful to many parents is that they keep a journal. So journaling, but kind of in a certain way. So if you have a blank journal and think of the person that's responding is like your absolute best friend. So say, Adrian, you're like, he's like, oh, I'm so stressed right now. And then your best friend responds and says, oh, I'm so sorry you're feeling that way. And you just kind of write to yourself over and over again. You can set like a three minute timer. and You're like, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> like it, it just takes like three minutes. You just write to yourself as if you're your best friend. You talk about like literally what's going on with you and then just write back to like what your best friend would say to you. Wow. I've never heard of that strategy. Yeah. Uh, Great. That's awesome. Great. Okay. That's putting in the toolbox. If there was one thing, one takeaway today that we should keep in mind going forward, what would that be? It's actually not something we've talked about yet, but something that everybody has with them all the time is their breath. And your breath is so regulating. You can calm your own nervous system down and help calm your kid's nervous system down just by doing a belly breath. So for you put your hand over your belly button and your other hand over the top of your chest and you take a deep breath, try to get more movement through your belly than you do through your chest and it engages um, your vagus nerve, which is right under your lungs and it calms your nervous system right down. You do three of those breaths, your blood pressure decreases, your heart rate decreases and you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to listen to an audio. It's available to you every second of every day. And it's available to little kids up to 100-year-old people. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think there's an age limit on that one. Yeah. Allison, thank you so much. Really appreciate your insight. I should mention, too, we'll have more resources on self-regulation on our website, wgme.com slash raising me. Dr. Coffin, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been great. In general, since talking with Dr. Coffin, I've been much more mindful of keeping softer lighting on in the evening. And sometimes, now I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes I'm switching out Taylor Swift on the playlist for some peaceful music, especially as we're winding down the day. And it is, it's really nice whether you're working on self-regulation or not. When it does come to dysregulation and those emotions getting out of control, another takeaway for me was that I always thought of dysregulation more of the aggressive, angry kind of big emotions, temper tantrum-like stuff. But as Dr. Coffin explained, it can look really different, opposite even. A dysregulated child might completely retreat into themselves. So 
for me, that's just something that I'm keeping in mind. And it may not always be easy, but here we are reminded once again, like in so many of the topics we have taken on in Raising Me, that we have got to stay calm, be strong, and really, most importantly, react with empathy for our kids. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Adrienne Stein. This episode is edited by Megan Littlefield and produced with Nate Eldridge. Please take a moment to follow Raising Me wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, we'd be grateful for a positive rating and review. It helps others to find this message as well. So wherever you are, I hope you learned something new and get to take a little time for you.